Residents in Florida are used to hurricanes and tropical storms, but in September 2022, the west coast of the state experienced one of the most devastating hurricanes in years. Hurricane Ian hit the west coast of Florida, and then it slowly moved inland. That's closer reporter Ben Walsh. And when a hurricane hits coastal areas of Florida, you get homes that are washed away. We are still tracking Hurricane Ian restrengthening in the Atlantic. But look at some of this new video just coming in. This was of a home that was getting swept away in Fort Myers, Florida. Roofs that are blown off. And a storm surge that causes massive flooding in coastal areas. What was beachfront property now underwater, with fears of more catastrophic flooding to come. And what made Ian so unique was that it kept going inland and it slowed down. And it dropped 20 inches of rain over parts of Florida. And so there was massive flooding inland in places that are far away from the coast and in places that don't normally experience that kind of devastation from hurricanes and flooding. There were calculations that were done showing that Ian dropped something like 20% more rain due to the warming climate. So it was a massively devastating storm, and it was significantly more devastating because of the amplifying effects of climate change. Usually after hurricanes like Ian, homeowners file an insurance claim for repairs and rebuilding. But in recent years, getting that insurance has become more expensive and more difficult. Rates have skyrocketed, and several national insurance carriers have even left the state. So will a deal made in the Florida legislature be enough to curb the state's insurance meltdown before the next big storm? This is The Closer. I'm Amy Keene. Getting insurance in the state of Florida has become a real headache. Property owners in multiple states are facing skyrocketing premiums and hard to get coverage. But the insurance industry itself says Florida's market is in full meltdown. The Florida insurance market has been in the process of melting down for years now. You have a number of factors that are part of that meltdown. Big national insurers like farmers have left the state. First tonight, another insurance company is leaving Florida. The state estimates 100,000 Florida families are about to lose their homeowner's insurance when farmers leave. And some have cut Florida policyholders from their insurance roles. And since 2017, almost a dozen insurers that offered home policies in the state have simply gone out of business and more are teetering on the brink. And beyond the big names that are fleeing the state, The insurers who are still there writing policies are jacking up their rates and sticking many homeowners with premium increases of 40 percent or more. This is happening to people all over the state. Lutz resident Mary Kilgore's premium went from $1,900 to $4,300. And Angela Moya in Volusia County went from $700 to $1,500. So it's a real mess and homeowners are just paying more and more and more. You can imagine compound a 40% increase over three or four years, and it's a real bite. Insurance is meant to offer homeowners some protection against property damage. You pay a relatively small premium up front, usually, and the insurance provider is meant to cover, at least in part, the more substantial repair costs that could come later. And the insurance company makes money by insuring enough people with homes in enough different areas and different kinds of risk, and maybe even they dabble in different kinds of insurance policies to spread the risk even further, that no one storm event or in any one year is so significant that they're out of business. And so the idea is to spread the risk and allow the person who's taking on the risk to make a profit as they're doing it. But the irony in Florida is that this insurance is costing more and more each year. Now, insurance is required for homeowners who have a mortgage on their home, but it's becoming less affordable for these homeowners, forcing some to leave the state altogether. 
homeowners are facing really tough questions, and a lot of people are trying to shop around to see if they can get a better rate. A lot of times that's not available. There are some parts of the state, particularly in very storm-prone areas of Miami, where people are seeing such dramatic increases in their rates that they are choosing to leave. And you're also seeing a real difficulty in prospective home buyers because obviously when you're buying a home with a mortgage, you need to have the insurance lined up. And so that's basically a cost of closing to have homeowners insurance. And you know, if you're closing on a $350,000 home and all of a sudden the insurance is $12,000 and interest rates have gone up, the cost of closing on that home is much higher. And so you are seeing cases in Florida where real estate agents are saying, hey, I've lost multiple closings this year because everything was lined up and then the cost of home insurance pushed things over the edge and the buyer backed out. No other state in the country is anywhere near this. I recently spoke to insurance policy expert Mark Friedlander about this. Mark has been in the insurance industry for almost two decades and runs communications for the Insurance Information Institute, an industry group. He says that while hurricane risk in Florida is very real, the insurance market is out of whack even if you take into account the state's extreme weather. Yes, occasionally states will have bad years. Louisiana had a historic level of hurricane activity back in 2020. They're going to post a very bad result for the industry there. That's understandable. But Florida, year after year, and many of those years have zero hurricane activity in the state, doesn't make sense. So it's a real problem because... It's becoming unaffordable. The price of real estate has skyrocketed here in Florida because of demand. But now we're hearing from the real estate community that are very concerned that their buyers of properties can't find affordable insurance. The meltdown in the Florida property insurance market started after an earlier hurricane hit the state in 2017. This one was called Irma. Hurricane Irma is now the most powerful hurricane ever recorded in the Atlantic Ocean. On its current path, Hurricane Irma is aiming for Florida. Welcome back, everyone. South Florida just hours away now from taking a direct hit from Hurricane Irma. So Florida had this string um, starting a little more than a decade ago of a pretty long period with no significant storms making landfall which for the state is great news for property owners and for insurance companies because property owners are paying their insurance premiums, insurance companies are collecting them, and they're not having to pay out massive storm damage claims. And then that string of years without large storms is broken by Hurricane Irma. And Hurricane Irma was a significant storm that caused lots of damage. But at that time, the Florida insurance market was fairly sound. He learned about hard work and... Before Irma and before the meltdown started, a state senator was elected in Florida named Jeff Brandis in 2012. A leader who brings people together. Jeff Brandis... He is a relatively younger politician or ex-politician now. He left the Florida legislature last year. And he is very much a sort of centrist Republican and is a big believer in market-based ideas and market-based solutions to policy questions. And he now runs a think tank focused on Florida state policy issues. I served in the legislature for 12 years, and now I'm the president of the Florida Policy Project. Florida has a state-owned, not-for-profit insurance company called Citizens, which is intended to be a property insurer of last resort. And by the time Hurricane Irma hit, Citizens had about 450,000 policies, which is in the ballpark that Brandis and others think is a reasonable number of policies for it to have. And I really use citizens as a barometer for the health of the overall property insurance market in the state of Florida, because I think it's very helpful to do that. So what begins to change is that the private insurance market starts its meltdown. And what ends up happening is that there's a massive increase in litigation against private insurance companies. Private insurance companies start dropping people from their roles. They start raising premiums dramatically. They start, in some cases, as we discussed before, pulling out of the state entirely. And as a result of that, citizens, the state-owned not-for-profit, starts gobbling up massive numbers of homeowner policies in Florida. And crucially, they are policies that are concentrated in the most populous parts of the state, This is Southern Florida, Miami-Dade, 
the Tampa area. And so they have this really concentrated risk and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. You mentioned litigation. I think this is a good place to get into one of like the crucial driving forces in the property insurance meltdown, insurance scams. Tell us about these insurance scams. Yeah, so this is a huge problem and it has its own name, the Florida Roof Scam. A study commissioned by a political action committee in Florida found property insurance companies paid $15 billion in litigated claims since 2015. At one point, insurance companies were being sued 900 times a month in Florida. Florida alone was responsible for 80% of all insurance lawsuits filed in the U.S. And here's how it worked. So roofers would go and offer to inspect homeowners' roofs for free. And they'd say, lo and behold, there's damage. And that your roof needs to be fully replaced. And they would pressure the homeowner to sign a contract giving the roofer the right to file an insurance claim for them. And this is called an assignment of benefits. It's a crucial part of the deal. The insurance company sends its own inspector out and they find no damage. And then the contractor links up with a somewhat unscrupulous trial attorney and they sue the insurance company in court. And the insurance company doesn't want this headache and says, okay, I'm just, I'm settling. And so what ends up happening is that huge amounts of Florida homeowners get new roofs replaced for free, but obviously it's not actually free. And what does the insurance company end up doing? Well, it does two things. One is that when these cases are filed, largely they settle them because they don't want the headache and they don't want the cost associated with a knockdown, drag out court battle. Importantly, one of the reasons they don't want to go to court is because in Florida at the time, if a homeowner sued an insurance company and won, the insurance company was on the hook for the homeowner's legal bills. So you're just getting compounding costs here and the insurance company wants no part of it. And then the other thing that they did is they said, well, the cost of business in Florida is going up dramatically. Rates have to go up dramatically. So they started jacking up rates. And they also started pulling out of certain areas, trying not to grow, you know, not renewing policies, all kinds of tactics to shrink the risk associated with this roof scam problem. Okay, so Ben, the question that I have is, what's the precedent for this? You said something like 80% of all U.S. property litigation happened in this period in Florida. Is this normal? Absolutely not. No. There are other states in the U.S. that are obviously very close to Florida that have similar, although maybe not as high, storm risk as Florida does. So think parts of Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, parts of Alabama. They see none of this litigation activity. And this was a point that was driven home to me by Mark Friedlander, and he knows a ton about the role litigation has played in the meltdown that's happening. The extreme level of litigation in Florida is something we've never seen before in U.S. history. On average, more than 100,000 property claim lawsuits being filed against Florida insurers, accounting for nearly 80% of all U.S. property claim lawsuits. So clearly out of whack, four out of every five lawsuits only being filed in Florida didn't make sense. And then we had claim fraud where we had these schemes, for example, contractors going door to door soliciting business to replace roofs that don't need replacement. Now, certainly if a roof gets damaged in a windstorm or a hurricane, that should be covered by your insurance. Wear and tear is not covered. And that's the scam that's been taking place in Florida for many years where these unscrupulous actors are literally going door to door in communities, including my own home. I've had numerous unscrupulous contractors come to my door. Ben, it seems like it's kind of risky to open the door in Florida. (laughs) It does seem that way. And it was pretty funny. Mark was aghast that one of these people would come to his home. And I think he made it not worth their time. I live in a subdivision of about 750 homes. And I could safely say two thirds of those homes have gotten free roofs over the last five years. Where homeowners are being roped into deals they don't understand. They're signing away their rights to a claim, thinking this is the greatest deal I've ever heard of. And the old saying, when it's too good to be true, it probably is. Because basically what he's just described to us is this like really ridiculous scenario where 
there's like, if I may say, con artists going from door to door. What is it about the state of Florida that seems to sort of foster this mode of business? Yes. So this whole package of insurance litigation issues, it basically stems from specific Florida laws that are very generous towards homeowners in terms of how they interact with their insurance companies, and then also fairly deferential to trial attorneys. And so you put those two things together, and you have this sort of toxic brew. And one of the things that really stuck out to me in talking to Mark and to Jeff is that these scams and this insurance litigation problem, it is a policy problem, and the policies create the opening. But the proliferation of it is a learned behavior. And so there's massive amounts of discussion and networking among trial attorneys, contractors, use this tactic, don't use this tactic. You know, there's these things that Mark discussed where if a roofing company is replacing a homeowner's roof for free through this insurance litigation process, they'll require that the homeowner allow them to place a sign in their yard saying, this homeowner's roof is being replaced for free through insurance. If you want this, call this number. So there's this kind of social aspect of it that really sort of takes hold and it becomes its own self-perpetuating industry in the state. I think we've got a really good sense now of the like very Florida specific scam that is driving these increase in rates. But all of this is happening against a much bigger, quite pervasive issue, which is the increasingly changing climate, which has the potential to bring increasingly violent storms to Florida. What is the role that climate change is playing in these increased property insurance rates? Climate change is very much the sort of Damocles in this story. It's hanging over everything. It means that when major hurricanes hit Florida, they're more damaging. It means that major hurricanes are more likely to hit Florida more often in the coming years. And it also means that when major hurricanes do hit, the kind of damage that they do is different. And the areas that were impacted were not just the coastal zones that get buffeted with high winds and you know a storm surge and the sort of classic uh, images of a hurricane hitting Florida that we think of. What happened with Ian is that it hit sort of the middle of Florida's west coast, and then it slowly crawled inland and just dumped massive amounts of rainfall as it crawled across the state. And so flooding did a huge amount of damage far inland as well when Ian hit. Officials say more than $207 million in claims have already been paid out by insurance companies. The damage is estimated to be more than $100 billion in the state. Remember that Ian was the hurricane that hit just last year. So Ben, this brings us back to citizens. This is the so-called insurer of last resort in the state. But in the midst of the roofing scam, in the midst of recent hurricanes, how significant of a role is it playing in Florida? Yeah, Citizens is now the state's largest home insurer. Uh, Part of that is because other insurers have left the state, but another part of it is that they're often able to undercut private competitors. And the company itself is in rocky shape. Here's Jeff Brandis again. Right now, Citizens is at 1.5 million policies. They're sitting on eight, $10 billion of cash, which sounds like a lot of money. But when you look at it overall, they have $500 billion of total exposure uh, out there. And so they're incredibly risky. And again, we would never let a property insurance company, the officer insurance regulation would never let a property insurance company that was in the private market do what Citizens is doing today. It's kind of unfathomable that they would have that kind of risk profile. At the same time, they're not able to raise their rates at the levels that they know they need to. In fact, they have requested to raise rates higher, uh, but have been turned down by the Office of Insurance Regulation. So what does this mean for all of these homeowners that are relying on property insurance by a state back provider that is in such a tricky position? Well, What it means is that citizens is at a very real risk of not being able to pay out on insurance claims. If a major storm hits the densely populated areas where it has a lot of policies and does tens of billions or a hundred plus billion dollars in damage, which is not unfathomable, 
That's something that Ian did, and we've seen it before in Florida. So it's a very real possibility that citizens might not be able to pay out on its claims. Even the governor, Ron DeSantis, has admitted this. If you did have a major, major hurricane hit with a lot of citizens, property holders, uh, it would not have enough to, to, to pay out. And what's really interesting is what happens if citizens can't pay out. And that's a very specific process that's mandated by law. And what happens is that first, Citizens goes to all its policyholders and says, you have to pay a surcharge that's up to 50% of your current policy in order to help us make good on the claims that have come in. And if that's not enough to pay out the claims that citizens has, which it very well might not be, citizens is allowed to go to every single insurance holder in the state of Florida, home and auto and other kinds of insurance policies, and say, you have to pay it a premium to citizens. So basically what's happening there is that if citizens is put in a position where it can't pay out, Florida taxpayers, specifically Florida insurance customers, have to put the money on the barrel and help them out. It makes you wonder, what's the point of paying the premium alone if that's not enough to cover the insurance you think you're getting? That's right. And that is a point that Jeff Brandis made, which is that when you think about it, citizens' policies are not actually insurance because they're not based on the actual actuarial risk of the property. They're a different kind of financial support for Florida homeowners, but they do not function like private property insurance does. This takes us to December 2022 and a special session of the state legislature to try to tackle Florida's insurance problem. We were looking at the imminent collapse of a substantial number of companies leaving Florida. We'll be right back. With the Florida property insurance market melting down, last year state legislators finally intervened. The Florida special session that happens in December 2022 really comes about as the Florida insurance market is melting down. Rates are rising, as we've talked about. Citizens is gobbling up tens of thousands of homeowners a month on their rolls. Things are looking pretty bleak. Insurance companies are leaving, they're folding, and Jeff Brandis calls for a special session and says, we've got to sit down and take this issue on and figure it out because this cannot go on. Now, remember, at this point, Brandis is still a state senator. And he's among those calling for a special session to fix things because things have gotten so bad. There's a first special session in the spring, but that doesn't lead to a fix. Things keep getting worse. How bad? Brandis makes a pretty dramatic comparison. The state of Florida essentially had stage four cancer in its property insurance world. And in the first special session, they decided to treat the flu. They didn't make any of the major changes that needed to be done. They tried to give it some medicine, but none of the substantial things that needed to be done were accomplished. And the patient got sicker between the first special session and the second one. And they realized, you know, listen, the whole market could die off here if we don't ultimately fix it. And so they came in and did kind of the major surgery that has should have been done years ago that they knew that needed to be done. But they ultimately got the political courage and will to do it in December. And so in December of 2022, the governor and the heads of the state legislature sit down and basically figure out a way to prop the insurance market up. The deal the state legislature reaches with the governor includes three big things. It's a billion dollars in state funding to help support the insurance industry. Litigation reform, this is key. Homeowners are now barred from signing away their right to file an insurance claim over to a contractor or a lawyer, and insurance companies no longer have to pay policyholders' legal fees. And the third thing was to start kicking people off of the citizens' insurance company's roles. The bill that came out of the session mandates a strategy called depopulation, which sounds really draconian. When David Bryant received a depopulation notice in the mail from Citizens Insurance, it didn't come as a total surprise. There's been a dance with me going on citizens and going off as citizens. In practice, what it means is that any homeowner that can get a private policy that's within 20% of what they're paying at Citizens is required to take the private policy. 
and private insurers sort of come in and are able to look at the citizens' books and decide which homeowners they might want to go out with offers to. And private insurers then notify homeowners that they'd like to take over their policy. If it's within 20%, the homeowner has to take it. And one of the things that really allowed this deal to come together was that the previous leadership of this chambers, the two chambers of the Florida legislature, had been unwilling to address the issue. But what happened was there was a change in the leadership, and that Brandis said that that basically was what made the deal happen, was new legislative leaders came in, and that changing of the guard allowed them to sit down and hash out a deal with the governor, which was the kind of pact that the previous leadership had not been willing to do. Why were they so unwilling? Well, one of the things that Brandis pointed out is that there's no one in Florida who's pointing towards a grand vision of what the insurance market in the state should look like. And so there's no path forward that doesn't involve some very hard choices and for sure some significant short-term pain for either taxpayers in terms of doling out state funds to support the industry or to insurance customers in terms of rising premiums. And so it's the sort of policy conundrum where legislators can't make everyone happy and they certainly can't make homeowners, which are a very powerful constituency, happy. And they also certainly can't make trial attorneys who are very generous donors to a lot of their campaigns happy by changing anything. They can make the trial attorneys happy by not doing anything. So a bill is one thing, but actually putting this into practice is another matter. And this is a really big problem to be solved. What effect have the components of this deal had on the property insurance meltdown? It is a massive problem. And as we've talked about, it was building for years and years. And the bottom line with the special session bill is that it's kind of working, but it's slowly working. Rates are still rising at a huge clip. You know, some homeowners are still seeing those 30 to 40% annual increases. But there are now private insurers coming into Florida and citizens' roles are finally starting to fall. So there are new providers coming back into the state or perhaps coming into the state for the first time. Yes, it's remarkable. And Mark Friedlander said that that's one of the most positive things that he's seen out of the legislation. I'll give you two examples. One is six new companies have been approved by the state regulator to start writing property insurance in Florida. And that's just in the last few months. The last several years, no company wanted to touch Florida. There's no way any company that's writing business in another state would come to Florida and say, oh, we want to be there. Nobody wanted to be here because it was an unprofitable situation. But now companies are literally knocking on the door of Florida saying, we'll write in Florida. We feel we could write profitably in Florida because of the legislative changes. And what does Brandis make of the deal that was struck and the effect of it today? Well, he thinks that basically it was a huge step forward and that there are still some significant things that need to happen. You know, this is a huge ship. It's going to take a long time to turn it. And you, if you get a wrong speaker, a wrong Senate president, and they're w unwilling to fix any of these problems, then that could delay us two years, which really means two years of legislative delay is really a four-year market delay, right? Because it takes two years beyond the implementation time of this. And I think that's the challenge. While things are improving at Citizens, there is still reason to be worried. The U.S. Senate recently started an investigation into the insurer to try to understand its liabilities. The Senate wants to find out if another big storm could push Citizens over the edge and force Florida to ask for a federal bailout. What does this mean for homeowners when the next potentially big storm hits the state? What it means for homeowners in the short term is that rates are going to continue to go up and that if they're a citizen's customer, that it's very likely that they will be approached by a private insurance company to replace their citizen's policy. And what it means when the next big storm hits is that there's a huge amount that's dependent on how many people transition off of citizens and onto private insurers before that big storm hits. So if the next big storm hits 18 months from now, that's better than the next storm hitting six months from now. But 
that time delay is not that useful if hundreds of thousands of people in the meantime are not shifted onto private insurance. So that's really the key is how many policies can move from citizens to the private market and how quickly. Mm -hmm. This is very much a Florida story, and, and you've described for us why it has been unique to the state. But in the context of climate change and of natural disasters hitting the state, we've seen over the last several years, in particular this last summer, that there are many other parts of the country that are being affected by natural disaster. Is this a sort of cautionary tale for other parts of the country when it comes to property insurance? I think it is in the sense that it's an indication that climate change is going to test the policy framework for insurance in your state. If there are sort of gaps or weak points in the insurance market in your state, they either need to be filled as soon as possible and new policies need to be put in place to strengthen the insurance market. Or if a disaster hits, those weak points are going to be exposed. And so Mark Friedlander made the point of Colorado, which has obviously seen a lot of fire-related catastrophe, putting in place legislation recently to create a new state-backed insurer of last resort as a way of strengthening its insurance market. When you sort of step back after having been looking at the story in such detail, what do you make of it? Or what do you sort of take from this particular story in Florida? I think that the key takeaway from this is that private markets can be extremely disjointed from the public good, and we know that. But this really shows the extent to which some unscrupulous actors can really push the boundaries of the legal system to exploit policies that were put in place largely with good intentions. And then once that begins to happen, how difficult it is to change the system. Jeff was talking to me about how one of the real advantages that the trial attorneys and their allies had in sort of preventing reform was that they didn't have to do anything. All they had to do was nothing and things worked out great for them. And so, yes, they, they spent a lot of money to try to influence things in the state government. But at the end of the day, all they needed to win was for nothing to change. And the reformers needed to put together a package that really shifted things dramatically. And that is always much, much harder to do. There's much more from this episode coming this week for Brazen Plus subscribers on Apple Podcasts. Now, that's it for this episode and for the third season of The Closer. It's been such a pleasure to bring you stories of deals that have changed the world this year. Since we launched in February, we've produced more than 35 episodes, plus a ton of bonus episodes. And as we wrap up the season and this year, we want to thank you for spending your precious time with us. We see you in the comments and in the weekly numbers, and boy, do we appreciate you. And for one last time this season, I want to thank the brilliant team that makes this show every single episode. The Closer is a production of Project Brazen in partnership with PRX. Our show is produced by Jay Venables, Isabel Kirby McGowan, Trina Menino, Anna Muto, and Jessica Martinez de Hose. Ben Walsh is our reporter, Marian Hell Gonzalez is our project manager, and Lucy Woods is head of research. Megan Dean is programming manager, and Ryan Ho is design lead. Golda Arthur is our showrunner, and Bradley Hope and Tom Wright are executive producers. Our marketing consultant is Maggie Taylor, and I'm Amy Keene. Thanks for listening. <laughs>